This is Ronald, the Rules Lawyer. I continue my law school series where I teach different parts of the Pathfinder 2e system and talk about why I think it's awesome. In the last part, I did an overview of how characters are made in Pathfinder 2e. In this video, I'm going to talk about the design decisions that Pathfinder 2e made. Compare them to other systems, especially D&D 5th edition, why I think these were good decisions, and this includes why I think multiclassing had to die in order for characters to thrive. I am Ronald, the Rules Lawyer. I am a lawyer who has been GMing Pathfinder 1st and 2nd Edition, D&D 5th Edition, and Starfinder for the last 13 years. Also taught an after-school and middle school class for tabletop role-playing games. So that's our glimpse into how you make a character in Pathfinder 2e. There are more steps, and as you can see, you can really customize your character in great detail. But I would argue also that it's easier if you worry in other systems that your character build will underperform in a combat. And I'm going to go into why that's true in this next part of the video, where I analyze why I think character creation is awesome. So Pathfinder 2e is trying to solve a set of problems that come from the previous edition of Pathfinder rooted in 3rd edition D&D. I did a video, this was earlier in the Law School series, where I covered a whole variety of issues that Pathfinder 2e tries to address from older editions. It will be good to look at that after this one. But in 3rd edition D&D and Pathfinder 1st edition, which continued 3rd edition, there was a lot of customization of characters. However, some would argue that the number of options was too many. In 1st edition Pathfinder, you had a huge number of feats, and I'm just going to scroll through uh, the thousands of feats, well, some of the thousands of feats you can get in Pathfinder 1st edition. I'm going to use this slider here. Uh, they actually are different categories as well. Uh, yeah, that's a lot. If you limited yourself with the core rulebook in Pathfinder, the number of choices you had to make was actually not that different from 5e, until you got to the point of when you chose your first level feat. And this is how many feats were presented to you in the core rulebook alone. Another problem accompanying this sheer amount of options was there was a pressure to study them all in order to keep up. Despite the appearance of many choices, if you wanted to be an archer in first edition Pathfinder, there was kind of the same set of feats every archer character got. And I'm going to give viewers who are familiar with first edition Pathfinder a second to guess what I'm about to show on the screen. You can pause if you want, but here they are. And yes, you were right. And also, there were, if you studied your options hard enough, ways you could break the game. There were ways to use feats, multi-class level dips, spells, to create broken combinations that the designers didn't plan for. And not every player who wanted to play a role-playing game would necessarily want to engage with this puzzle that was character creation. It was very common for two players to arrive at the same table in the system, and one person focused on optimization, whereas another person uh, was prioritizing expressing their character concept, and the first player could outperform that player and maybe everyone else in the party put together. D&D 5e came out in 2014, five years after 1st edition Pathfinder. It was competing with 1st edition Pathfinder, which actually became the leading TTRPG during the wind down of 4th edition. And so it sought to address these problems, people disaffected by these tendencies within 1st edition Pathfinder. So one thing it did was it borrowed Pathfinder 1's idea of subclasses, which were called archetypes in Pathfinder 1st edition. So in that respect, uh, some more customization. But it was basically not customization via choosing a feat here, a feat there, a multi-class level dip there. It was through choosing a path which is kind of ironic because it was taken from Pathfinder. Outside of that, character customization was streamlined considerably. 5e brought fewer choices. Feats were an optional rule. And even if your DM allows feats, they are optional because you forego an ability score increase in order to get a feat. It allows a player to not engage with the feat subsystem at all and not have to read a single feat. They would just increase their ability scores. 5e also has had a much smaller list of feats, which over the last nine years now, it's smaller than what the Pathfinder core rulebook gave. But the feats in 5e are also more powerful and obvious in their usefulness, more user-friendly when you are looking at the list. 
What remains for character customization in 5e besides your race, background, and class is the subclass you choose within your first three levels. So this makes making a character much quicker in 5e. The next thing they did was to make your numbers matter less. They wanted to remove the mini game of stacking bonuses to get your numbers as high as possible. So they flattened the math with bounded accuracy. They made proficiency bonus go from plus two to plus six. They cut out a lot of the bonuses and penalties that were prevalent in Pathfinder 1 and 3rd edition D&D and largely replaced those with advantage and disadvantage. They also made multi-classing an optional rule in 5e. And for those tables that use multi-classing, they disincentivize or try to disincentivize level dips by spreading the core features of every class over their first three levels instead of their first level. This was supposed to discourage level dipping, making you feel like you need to take three levels from a class in order to get the full benefits of that class. 5e's approach was to try to serve as a bridge for players of all previous D&D editions. And that included using the base chassis of characters from 3rd edition, including the ability to stack levels from different classes on top of each other. Then from that, they cut things off. They locked things off while bringing in subclasses from Pathfinder 1e. Now, did they succeed at addressing the problems of 3rd edition character creation? Well, partially. First, there is less imbalance between characters. However, there still is imbalance between characters. The martial caster disparity is often talked about in 5e circles, but also one can produce a lot more damage if one takes feats compared to someone else who does not. Also, it's a common complaint in 5e circles that there's not enough choices that you get to make, and that after the first three levels, there isn't much to look forward to in terms of advancing your character. That characters of the same race and class tend to be copies of each other. There's a desire for more customization. And also the imbalance between characters uh, means that it's harder to express a concept. You can start with a nifty idea for your character. However, it's like juggling two plates. There's your concept on one plate and then making your character viable in combat on the other plate. Often the two things are at war with each other. So what does Pathfinder 2e do? Well, first, its goal was to have the same level of customization that you see in 3rd edition D&D and 1st edition Pathfinder while streamlining the process, making it more user-friendly, and evening out the power disparities between characters. Now, how is this possible? Doesn't more options by itself mean there will be more broken things introduced into the system that the designers don't account for? Well, that would seem to be true. And I think what Pathfinder 2e is pretty innovative and eye-opening for designers and is worth looking into. So I have a few observations to make here. The first is that I couldn't find a more articulate way to express this, but I think it's maybe the plainest way. There are many things you get, but there are ceilings on how high you can go with those things. So the first thing, the very first thing we saw earlier was how Attributes are determined. You get a lot of bonuses, nine of them. However, you can only stack them so high. Every step of this process, each column, only allowed you to put one bonus into any given attribute. If you're like most players, and this is definitely true for most character builds in Pathfinder 2e, you will want to get a maximum score in your class's key ability score. And the game kind of empowers you to get a plus four, into that score. However, it forces you to spread those boosts out to other scores. Also note that you get four boosts at this last step, and the first three attributes are all can be characterized as physical attributes, whereas the second set are all mental. And so every character is forced to branch out horizontally. So imagine a ceiling, you have all these blocks, and you're stacking them up, but you can only set them so high. And because you cannot stack them higher in your key attribute, you got to spread them out. You have to grow wide. We also see this with skill increases. At third level, you can only increase one of your skills to expert. And at fifth level, when you get your next increase, you can only increase skills up to expert. 
So let's say Drew wants to be really good at preaching religion and knowing about religious subjects and wants to be expert and so increases his religion skill to expert at level three. At level five, he cannot bring it up to master. He can't do that yet until seventh level. So that forces him to go wide and be expert in another skill. He's going to be expert in nature, which lets him train more goblin dogs and also identify natural phenomena and primal magic and the abilities of wild beasts. Then at seventh level, he will become a master in religion. However, at ninth level, 11th level, and 13th level, he won't be able to increase that religion to legendary. That requires 15th level. So he's going to put those skill boosts into other skills. This is very different from what other editions of D&D and Pathfinder do. Let's contrast how Pathfinder and D&D 5e approach rogues. Now, rogues are supposed to be the masters of skills in the game. And the way Pathfinder expresses that is by letting rogues get a skill increase, not at third level and every two levels after that, but at second level and every single level after that. They get 19 skill increases over the course of 1 to 20. Also not listed here is that they get a skill feat at every single level, starting at first level up through 20. Whereas in D&D 5e, you get some more skill proficiencies than other classes do, but on top of that, you get to double your proficiency bonus for some of your skills, which lets you shoot through that ceiling. If you're a level 17, your proficiency bonus doubles to plus 12, and they get to add that to a skill of your choice. It means that you can be better in some skills like athletics than the barbarian ever can be. Despite 5e being the system that says it has bounded accuracy, it has much less control over its math. It's not necessarily a flaw of 5e, it's the legacy it got from other editions, but in comparison to Pathfinder 2e, it's less bounded. We further see how Pathfinder gives you lots of things but imposes ceilings through how you get attribute increases. At 5th level, Droog gets to put 4 more boosts. Let's say he puts them in the same attributes that he did at 1st level. Well, we have this caveat. Now, this is written before the remaster takes place, but the effect is going to be the same after the remaster, which is that you'll need to put 2 boosts into a score that you already have a plus 4 in, in order to get that up to a plus five. And you can't do that at level five, because remember, they have to go into different attributes. So it's gonna be 10th level before Droog gets to raise his wisdom up to a plus five. This effectively gives diminishing returns if you try to specialize in your key ability score and also maybe a secondary ability score. It gives incentive to the player to spread out their ability boosts more widely. This is key to how players often feel the freedom to branch out from their stereotypical niche. Our barbarian, who definitely wants to max out their strength, can, without much opportunity cost, get a good wisdom score so that they can be good at healing allies in combat with the battle medicine skill feat. You can have a marshal who is one of your primary in-combat healers in this game because the system is designed to have you spread out beyond one thing that you're good at. And our fighter who wants to hit things hard, be hard to hit, and have a lot of hit points can put some boosts into charisma. And there are mechanical ways through the rules you can make that charisma useful to you in combat. You can demoralize and debuff enemies, insult them with a bon mot skill feat. And when you're legendary in Intimidation, your fighter can scare enemies to death. So by preventing how tall you can grow your character, let's say, and specialize in any one thing and forcing you to grow wide, you remove the opportunity cost of spreading wide. You make it cost nothing in order to have a diversity of abilities that are outside your stereotypical niche. All right, so what's another thing Pathfinder does? Well, Pathfinder puts your choices into buckets. <laughs> so instead of our ungodly list from Pathfinder First Edition of having over 3,000 feats to choose from, what we had was 
a set of decisions to make at first level where at least if you're confining yourself to the core rulebook you don't have more than several choices to make at each step. There were six ancestries to choose from from the core rulebook and then five heritages for the goblin and then maybe eight feats that could be chosen for the goblin. Now Droog had a bigger list to choose from only because he decided to have the Asimar versatile heritage, unlocking another list of about five or seven feats. Then at second level, Droog had to choose, well, from a not tiny number of class feats. These are the first level class feats from the core rulebook, and there are these other feats at second level. Now, if Droog wants to delve deeper and shop among the archetypes, yeah, that's a list of things to look at. But if he starts with his concept, that should narrow down the choices. And in this case, with Blessed One, once he chose Blessed One Dedication, it doesn't really add a whole lot of other feats for him to read through. There's only one more feat that is available at fourth level. And this list grows gradually as he levels up. Now, Drew gets second level, also gets his skill feat. And there's a lot of skill feats in the game. However, again, if he's limiting himself to the core rulebook, it's not a huge overwhelming number. Listed here are the general skill feats, skill feats that are not tied to any one skill. And they all have their own prerequisites. And he can scan this chart to see what he qualifies for. What many players do is when they are able to choose a skill feat is think of the two, maybe three skills they really want to advance and just look at the subset of skill feats for that one. So let's say Droog wants to be really good at lying. <laughs> so he'll look at the core rulebook list and see the skill feats for that. So granted, this is more things to choose from and look through than you would have in D&D 5th edition. However, it is less than the 3000 plus you had in 1st edition Pathfinder and 3rd edition D&D. It's a controlled size of options, but all of these choices and things you have to look through, the analysis paralysis is mitigated by the next thing Pathfinder does, which is that the math is tight. The math is, quote, decided for you. Pathfinder controls your numbers. We've seen some of that earlier. And in all of the feats we looked at earlier, a lot of them are not giving you strict numerical bonuses. There are some that do, but those are pretty situational and not must picks. Again, although D&D boasts having bounded accuracy, Pathfinder is much stricter when it comes to binding its numbers. Pathfinder achieves balance by controlling your numbers and your choices have a relatively small effect on those numbers. There's a saying in the Pathfinder community that I helped popularize that every plus one matters. Because of the way Pathfinder's four degrees of success system works, whenever your check exceeds the number you're trying to reach by 10 or more, you critically succeed on that check. This works throughout the game. Conversely, if you fail by 10 or more, you critically fail. So you feel every plus one in this game very intensely. And we saw how Pathfinder controlled the math, but by how they did attribute scores. They knew that Droog almost certainly was going to get a plus four in his wisdom. And the designers did that deliberately so that they would know what your bonus likely would be. And so the monster statistics and the different numbers you have to meet and beat in this game have a set of base mathematical assumptions of where the character's numbers are based on their level. And we saw as Drew levels up, his reflex save will become expert at fifth level, just like every druid. His spell casting will be expert at seventh level, just like every druid. The designers also have controlled and know when you're going to be expert at your best skills, master and legendary, and also where your attributes are going to be. Drew's wisdom is going to be a plus five at 10th level. The fact that you can improve your attributes in Pathfinder and gain feats simultaneously is not simply out of generosity to players, but so that the designers know <laughs> what your scores are going to be. Also, the numerical bonuses to your magic items are going to be predicted by the designers because of how expensive they made a plus one, then a plus two, then a plus three weapon. You are not going to be able to afford a plus two weapon at level two. And remember, everything you're proficient in adds your level. So the game has an idea of where you are numerically based on your level. At seventh level, the game will know that you're gonna be an expert in your reflex saves while knowing that a rogue will be a master 
in her reflex saves and have evasion. Basically your level plus your training bonus and your attribute score in something is often the least important thing. Is the universal way all of your stats are determined in Pathfinder 2e. Your attack bonuses, your spell attacks, your spell DCs, your saving throw bonuses, your armor class, and because every plus one matters so intensely, every level up gives you so much more power vertically, your feats, when placed next to your numerical increases, are relatively minor in effect. They give you a horizontal progression. And while there's a lot of feats in Pathfinder, it, the designers have placed constraints on what feats can give you. Let's contrast what a feat in 5e might look like. So here's a 5e feat, Great Weapon Master. It gives you the option to take a minus five penalty to your attack roll with a heavy weapon in order to get plus 10 to your damage. This is considered an essential feat for many martial characters because that plus 10 bonus to damage is so good. And many monsters don't have very high armor classes and you can still relatively reliably hit them even with the minus five penalty. And in many instances, you can automatically assume you have great weapon master in effect. It becomes a math enhancer overall for your martial character. Well, the closest analog to this feat that we see in Pathfinder 2e, I think, is the feat power attack that fighters can take at level one. It gives you that bonus damage, it adds an extra die of weapon damage to your attack. However, it comes at the cost of spending two actions to use it. You have three actions per turn in Pathfinder, and this means you're doing power attack instead of attacking two times. However, you might want to use power attack when you're facing a very hard to hit foe and that second attack will almost certainly miss that second attack is going to suffer from the multiple attack penalty. Or if you're facing an enemy that has some kind of damage resistance, let's say a golem that resists the first 10 points of physical damage you inflict. In that case, you'll want to focus a lot of your uh, damage into a single hard-hitting blow. This is actually one of the few feats that give an obvious mathematical enhancement to one of your attacks, but it is situational and it gives you a choice to make. It comes at the cost of more actions. We also see that feats in Pathfinder often are themselves defined actions. Think battle master maneuvers that you cannot do simultaneously with each other. They're competing for your actions. Given this, you could say that the power increase of your character, that 90% of it is simply in your math improving as you level up. And what feats provide you are ribbon abilities, things that accompany that more important vertical progression. And one interesting effect of this is that it makes the math so stable that one of the popular variant rules in Pathfinder, Free Archetype, which gives you a bonus feat every even numbered level to take an archetype feat, doesn't terribly imbalance the game. It basically doesn't matter the sheer number of feats you have because the math, the basic math, is so impactful. Now, this is a controversial viewpoint. Many people who are fans of 3rd edition D&D and 1st edition Pathfinder see the bounded math of Pathfinder 2e as constraining. It prevents them from building unique characters in their view. Now, my view on the matter <laughs> is that having players still have that ability to break the math of the game prevalent in those editions and to some degree in 5e makes it harder to balance encounters to meaningfully challenge parties. And it also creates those diverging pressures when you make a character of expressing your concept on the one hand and optimizing your character on the other hand. Lastly, I prefer this edition's approach to having your players win by the decisions they make during combat and working together as a team rather than what each individual did while creating their character at home. Also, one could argue that the many choices you have, the thousands of feats, provided an illusion of choices because a lot of those things were just chaff. Our example of the archer earlier. If you were an archer who did not take the, one of those four feats that I showed earlier, you're not being a good archer. The next thing Pathfinder does is 
use level to great effect and impose quality control on what players can get at certain levels. For good or ill, you will not find an ancestry like Asimar in this game that lets you fly at level one. Pathfinder consciously gates certain abilities to certain levels. So Droog, our druid who is divinely inspired and is part Asimar somehow, cannot fly until a level nine ancestry feat that furthermore only lets him fly once per day for 10 minutes. If he wants that to be an at-will ability, no daily limit, he needs to take a level 17 feat. Meanwhile, having flight at level 9 comes later than when parties can access the fly spell, which by the way is a spell that he as a druid can cast. As a 4th rank spell, he can cast that at 7th level. This choice is deliberate. Also, any character can get the winged rune applied to their armor. Armor and weapons get magical abilities conferred on them via runes, which can be transferred back and forth. And the winged rune lets someone once per hour fly, but it's a 13th level item. This means that the fly spell and an Asimar who is able to fly once per day at 9th level are able to do something that's unique and not generally available to other players for several levels. That too was a conscious choice by the designers. And monster design in Pathfinder also takes into account at what levels party members are able to fly as well. Basically, in Pathfinder, you get the sense that the designers had some kind of design document and said some abilities will be available at this level and others at that level, and that this was planned from level 1 to 20. And you get a sense with every new source book that comes out that more than one set of eyes looked at something that was written to make sure it fit within those broader parameters. Meanwhile, level becomes our measure of how strong something should be. Most archetypes give you the dedication feat at second level. And we'll remember that Droog's dedication feat gave him a spell that's available to first level champions. And if we were to compare it to other level two class feats Droog could have taken, they are roughly of equal weight to what this level two feat is giving him. The Wild Shape focus spell, for example, compared to the Lay on Hands focus spell. Character level basically functions as a universal currency, uh, a measure of how to assess things and to control when abilities become available to player characters and also protect niches. For example, uh, the Blessed One archetype gives abilities that are exclusive to champions by unlocking these champion feats. However, if one were to look up these feats, the Blessed One gets each of them at a later or higher level than when the champion could get it. This protects the champion as the premier lay on hands character. Basically, Pathfinder put work and care into balancing the game. The market leader <laughs> um, has plus one weapons um, that are simply classified as uncommon. There's little guidance on when that becomes available and when the dungeon master should make that available to player characters. And anyone who plays 5e enough or sees the monster manual knows that whether you have a magic weapon is hugely impactful in assessing the threat of various monsters that have resistance to non-magical bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing damage. Winged boots are similarly called uncommon, but basically give you two hours of flying per day that can be used in one minute increments. For many, that's at will flying if they're not traveling over land. This too is simply called an uncommon item. So what's happening is that instead of the designers planning for when various things become available to the characters and then the game master able to use those decisions as um, jumping off points to make their own decisions the design of plus one weapons and wing boots leaves it entirely up to the dm and these are impactful decisions the dm is de balancing the game on the fly when deciding whether to give a plus one weapon to a fighter and werewolves and other lycanthropes who are immune to non-magical damage, this has a huge effect on encounter balancing and overall adventure balancing. Another effect of this um, quality control and organizing things by level is that it's less rewarding for players to study all the options 
that are available to them at a certain level because there's going to be fewer broken things or overpowered things uh, for them to choose from and find. Now, <laughs> some players want to find such things and this lessens the time needed to study all of the options uh, because there's been this care and work put into balancing the game. The last thing that Pathfinder 2e does is a big one, no multi-classing. Um, in third edition, Pathfinder first edition and fifth edition, you stack levels from different classes like building blocks. And when you take a first level from another class, you get a whole set of things from that class. This was more of an issue in third edition and first edition Pathfinder, where you simply got everything in that row. Um, let's say Droog were to take a level of Paladin. He would then be able to smite evil once per day and get all of these mathematical bonuses. And if he gets a second level, he gets to add his charisma to all of his saving throws and get lay on hands. Also, this style of multi-classing meant you stopped your progression in your initial class. So Droog would not be gaining any new spell slots or unlocking Druid spell levels from Druid. This meant that it was possible to make suboptimal decisions, especially if your main class is Spellcaster. Any level you take in another class is going to slow down your progression in your main ability, Spellcasting. At the same time, there are many tricks you could find if you searched for them that benefit you greatly by taking one or sometimes two levels from another class. So in Pathfinder 1st Edition and 3rd Edition D&D, a lot of the strongest builds were Franken characters that took levels from 3, 4, sometimes more classes. 5th Edition made a conscious effort to make poor choices less punishing and good choices less broken. First, your spell slots progressed in a uniform manner. If you started as a wizard, taking a level in Cleric meant your number of spell slots and the spell levels of those spell slots progressed at a comparable rate, more so if you took levels in full spellcasting classes. Another thing 5e did was to spread core features over the first three levels. There was less to nick to steal from the first level of other classes. However, now in hindsight, after nine years of this edition, the meta has developed where there still are trap options, things you do not want to do, and broken options, powerful things that you can do via multi-classing in 5e. The meta agrees that certain dips, level dips, are very powerful. Uh, taking one level in Cleric, taking two levels in Fighter for Action Surge, taking one level in Hexblade Warlock. This retains that same issue of rewarding optimizers and a specific reward for studying the entire breadth of options, creating that tension between expressing your character concept and optimization. So Pathfinder abandons multi-classing. The class you have at level one is your class all the way up to level 20. You don't stack levels anymore. This is not original with Pathfinder second edition. This actually was what fourth edition D&D did also. And you got abilities from other classes through feats. You can take abilities from other classes through archetypes, but archetypes are just glorified feet trees. <laughs> they might give you the abilities of another class, but it's only because that feat tells you you get X. Also, another restriction I didn't go over is that every archetype dedication feat you get requires you to take a total of three feats in that archetype before you take a dedication feat of another archetype. So this prevents shopping around and archetype dipping from a whole variety of archetypes so let's see how this plays out in practice. Droog, at level 2, 4, and 6, is going to take different Blessed One feats. Then he takes another archetype at level 8. He wants to be a marshal and lead his tribe on the battlefield. The marshal lets him give commands, orders to others, and inspire them and make them less afraid. He can take these feats at 8, 10, and 12. Meanwhile, his spellcasting as a druid is unchanged. At level 12, He's still going to be able to cast 6th rank spells, and his proficiency as a druid spellcaster is still going to progress the way his class features list says he's going to progress. He's still going to be an expert at druid spellcasting. The math is going to be the same. His wisdom is going to be at a plus 5 at this point. The effectiveness of casting chain lightning as a druid is going to be the same as compared to if he were to take purely druid feats up to this point. 
Also, the Animal Companion, his goblin dog, its math is going to be progressing as well. It adds Droog's character level to its statistics this entire time. However, he can't advance it, give it a nudge, by taking feats that advance his Animal Companion. And there's three more feats that he could take that improve its basic math over the course of level 1 to 20. His numbers are going up the same. Um, no matter whether he's taking archetype feats or druid feats, his class features are progressing his will saves the same, his weapon proficiency, his armor AC proficiency, and no matter what, at level 19, he's going to be legendary in his druid spellcasting. So by fixing the math, controlling his math, deciding his math for him, it's actually giving him more freedom to make more choices about how to express his character concept. This is all made possible because there's no multi-classing, and this has a number of advantages. First, it allows characters to be overall more balanced. The archetypes are not giving you levels in another class, but the designers now have the ability to give you what a level two class feat would give you. They're able to control the amount of power make sure it's not too big, and also make sure it's not too little, what that archetype dedication feat will give you. So the, the introductory feat should be comparable to a level two druid feat, or level two rogue feat for that matter. The designers can calibrate what these feats give you using the universal measure of level. So the level two fighter dedication, first you have to have a good strength and dexterity. What it gives you is only a subset, a small subset of what a level one fighter gets. It gives you trained proficiency in simple weapons and martial weapons. In Pathfinder, when you're a level one fighter, you become expert in simple weapons and martial weapons. You're also not getting everything else a first level fighter gets, uh, being trained in advanced weapons, training in all armor types, Attack of Opportunity reaction, the shield block reaction, and the first level fighter class feat. You're not getting any of those things. In fact, if you're already proficient with martial weapons, this doesn't get you anything at all. This is simply unlocking this feat tree for you. That's the benefit it gives you. But maybe you want to get Attack of Opportunity at level four. You also get fighter feats at relatively half your character level by first taking basic maneuver and later taking advanced maneuver. Another example is the Monk. In Pathfinder, at first level, you get the very powerful Flurry of Blows action. Once per turn, you can spend one action to make two attacks. Now, if that were made available to anybody with a level 2 Monk dedication feat, that would be too powerful. And so, it's actually available as a 10th level feat under the Monk archetype. Spellcasting. All of the archetypes that let you multi-class, quote-unquote, into a spellcasting class have a uniform set of feats called Basic Spellcasting, Expert Spellcasting, and Master Spellcasting, which give you certain um, leveled spell slots that scale with your character level, and you unlock higher leveled spell slots with more feats. They're going to be called ranks, however, in the remaster to prevent confusion with other uses of the word. But yes, if Droog were to delve into wizardry and spend four feats on the wizard archetype, he can get Master Spellcasting, which at 20th level would allow him to get, an, at most, an 8th rank spell slot. So it's a couple of spell ranks behind what a pure wizard would get access to under the arcane spell tradition. Basically, these will not exceed what somebody who actually has that class will be able to do with spellcasting. Note that these feats may be revised in the remaster, but they're still useful to make this point. Another advantage of no multi-classing is that you can have class-defining abilities at level one again, without fear that it's going to be stolen by a level dip. A lot of D&D 5e tables start their campaigns at third level because the first couple of levels, in addition to characters being too squishy for many tables' tastes, only give uh, a subset of their class-defining abilities. So that fighter can have all of those awesome abilities for fighting, attack of opportunity, being more accurate than anybody else, heavy armor, without the fear that anybody will take a level in fighter. It allows the designers to make you feel like a veteran adventurer of your class from the get-go, and also give you those class-defining features that your level one and level two class feeds can key off of 
from the get-go as well. Another advantage of no multi-classing is that archetypes are not limited by classes. There's a lot of archetypes in this game, and not all of them give you abilities from another class. There's a whole variety of things, and that means you can get an archetype that's focused not on everything that class would give you, but on something specific, something more focused. So let's say you're a fighter and you want to have an animal companion, maybe a large one that you can ride in battle like a horse. Well, you can take the Beastmaster archetype at level two, which gives you a whole set of feats that let you advance your animal companion and improve your ability to fight in tandem with that animal. Now, one could theoretically take the Druid archetype and gain animal companion feats through that, but you'd be limited to taking Druid feats up to half of your level. Some of those higher level Druid feats that really advance your animal companion would not be available if you were to take the Druid archetype. And maybe you don't want any spellcasting ability. Well, the Beastmaster is there for you. And the design space is open to meet your specific need. The design space is also open for other archetypes that are just cool concepts that don't fit into a class per se. The Shadow Dancer is one of the uh, more exclusive archetypes because, look, its dedication feat is available at level 8. But that means it could be designed to give you some more powerful abilities from the get-go. In this case, you get greater dark vision. You can even see through areas of deeper darkness in Pathfinder 2. And a level 10 feat lets you teleport from one shadowy area to another. More feats let you gain sneak attack damage when they are off guard to you or become invisible when you teleport from shadow to shadow. Another advantage to no multi-classing is that there's an exponential growth every time new options come out. In first edition Pathfinder, splat books, books with more options, would come out with more archetypes for each class. In 5e's cycle, we've seen books that give you more subclasses, which similarly are confined to a specific class. It means that in both systems, you might see a similar concept like pirate or swashbuckler being expressed through similar subclasses or archetypes being expressed multiple times over more than one class. However, in Pathfinder 2e, every single option, the Shadow Dancer we just saw, can be applied to every single class in the game. So the Beastmaster archetype we just saw, maybe the fighter wants to get that to ride a horse into battle or a wizard wants to get that to have a tiger companion. The Shadow Dancer archetype goes well with the rogue, but also maybe a spellcaster who creates magical shadows would want to take that also. Unlike with these other editions, every archetype that gets published in Pathfinder and any new class that comes with a multi-class archetype leads to an exponential growth in the number of options that characters can have. And on top of that, you can take multiple archetypes on your character. And not only are all of these combinations possible, but they're feasible. Droog can be a Beastmaster, Shadow Dancer, Marshal, and still be able to cast 10th level Druid spells. So that's my case. And I think Pathfinder 2e, by making these choices, provides the following strengths to character creation. You get a greater variety of choices. That's still retained from 3rd edition D&D and 1st edition Pathfinder. It's also not necessarily harder to peruse those choices and to commit to the decisions you eventually commit to because there's work and care put in making them balanced and providing a mathematical foundation to make sure that your choices are horizontal and not affecting the basic math. This means you can just have your character concept, and pick options that express that concept, and you're not going to fall behind. So we retain the more choices from previous editions, but you get more genuine freedom of choice. We can illustrate this conceptually. <laughs> because Pathfinder 2e fixes your vertical progression as you level up, you have more freedom to grow horizontally. And those choices you make via feats for your character are not inconsequential. There is a difference between Droog being able to heal people with lay on hands and transforming wild shaping into animals. The difference between his Blessed One archetype and taking a Druid feat. What Pathfinder succeeds at doing, I think is important for other crunchy tactical RPGs to consider. Right now, Wizards of the Coast is in the process of designing the next edition of D&D. And one of the design challenges that 
the designers have is to make levels one and two more interesting because many tables start at level three because of what I explained earlier. So to address that, Wizards has put out playtests that seek, sometimes seek, to make levels one and two more interesting. There was an early playtest that gave the Ranger, for example, a lot of powerful abilities at level one. However, because multi-classing is staying in the game, as far as we can tell, it means that every time Wizards puts more interesting abilities at levels one and two, it makes that class more attractive as a level dip. So in a recent playtest document, they put out a draft Warlock that lets the Warlock take an invocation at level one. And one of those invocations is Pact of the Blade, which is kind of a adaptation of Hexblade Warlock from 5e. As a bonus action, the Warlock can conjure a martial melee weapon of their choice, apply their charisma modifier to the attack and damage rolls, have the option of dealing necrotic, psychic, or radiant damage, and gain the mastery property of that weapon. Mastery properties are extra abilities that martial characters can apply to weapons that Wizards of the Coast created in order to give a buff to martial characters. However, this playtest warlock, the warlock has can cast ninth level spells eventually. With the same ability as their spellcasting modifier, Charisma use weapons, and the martial classes are limited to a handful of uh, weapon masteries. Whereas this warlock can conjure any weapon and gain its mastery property. This is a very attractive level dip. And they also get Eldritch Blast, which scales to your character level, not your Warlock level, and is maybe the strongest damage dealing cantrip in the game. So there's clearly an effort to make a level one weapon fighting Warlock viable, but it has the danger now of being a very attractive level dip uh, for other classes, especially those that use Charisma as their one of their better stats. We have two competing design goals, making levels one and two interesting and mitigating the, the exploits made possible by multi-classing. So what do the designers do to address this issue? They make and continue to say that multi-classing is an optional rule. And when I post a criticism of this Pact of the Blade ability on Twitter, one of the responses was, well, this is not a Warlock problem. It's a problem with multi-classing. And if that's a problem, then talk to your players about it. And so basically, remove multi-classing if you think it's a problem. The problem is, many people like multi-classing, like to customize their characters, like to have that ability. The GM is put in the position of being a bad guy. In order to have more balance in the game, you have to sacrifice customization. And if you keep that customization, the DM and the players have to deal with the consequences of that decision. Like with the plus one magical weapons and with winged boots, the designers are leaving it to the dungeon masters to figure out the balance of the game. And it becomes kind of a Sisyphean task to balance the game. Everything you do, every decision you make creates new problems. Pathfinder, by putting people on rails and limiting people's ability to multi-class gets to avoid this problem. And it's possible to start at level one feeling like your class. The fighter can have expert weapon proficiency, proficiency with all armor, attack of opportunity, shield block, and a first level class feat. The monk can have flurry of blows as a level one ability. It's also possible to give classes abilities that are impossible for other classes to get. Some rogues who choose the thief subclass can get dexterity added to certain weapon damage, which is not possible otherwise. Uh, rangers can get the very powerful Hunter's Edge ability to mitigate the multiple attack penalty or get bonus damage or get unattainable bonuses to their skill checks and AC to monsters that they focus on. The design space is opened up to give powerful abilities to classes that cannot be taken otherwise. Our Goblin Druid, through his choice of order, can heal his animal once per battle if there's 10 minutes between each battle to refocus with the heal animal order spell. And other druids need a fourth level druid feat to get that. The structure of characters and using level as a measure and restricting when people can get what makes it possible to give these goodies early on at level one for characters. Everything goes back to the initial point I made and said in a weird way, which is that you get many things 
but there are ceilings controlling how high you can raise those things. So if we look at a chart of what Droog will get at the first four levels, we see that's quite a lot of things. The reason why characters can be very different from each other and be balanced is because of that sheer number of things. <laughs> Droog can be different from other druids because he can choose one order. Meanwhile, he gets his own unique ancestry feat, whereas another druid will get a different ancestry feat. So Droog can be different from other druids because of his high features budget. All of these things he can get, he gets a lot of choices and they are horizontal and relatively balanced with each other. So at level two, he gets yet more things. He gets things at every level and he can branch out horizontally and get the ability to heal people with lay on hands. And later he can choose to wild shape, whereas another druid might want to wild shape at level two. Meanwhile, our fighter who hits really hard has enough of a features budget left over to put attribute boosts and skill increases into medicine so that he can be a great healer in battle as well, or put those points into intimidation so that eventually he can scare monsters to death. Pathfinder basically achieves its ability to customize and its ease of use by the fact that it gives you so many things to choose and work and care are put into balancing those choices. So that's it. If you enjoyed this video, I recommend checking out uh, one of my other law school videos in which I talk about how Pathfinder 2E fixes issues in 1E and D&D, not just character creation. And if you want a walkthrough on actually making a character, um, you might enjoy something I made really early in my channel before I learned a lot of things I know now, but it's more hands-on and goes through making a character with a paper character sheet. If you enjoyed this video, like and subscribe and also ring the bell to be notified about the future law school courses when they come out. And also join my Discord where we are now over 4,000 people talking Pathfinder, other games. You can also play Pathfinder 2E because of the drop-in play system we have for the system. Also support my Patreon if you want early access to Rules Lawyer videos and get exclusive access to a number of videos, including me, teaching and running Pathfinder 2E for D&D YouTubers. So that's it. I've been Ronald, the Rules Lawyer. I hope you enjoyed the video and I'll see you next time.